All right. Well, welcome everyone to our monthly webinar. And uh, tonight I'm delighted that we have Amy Goldman to talk about the Communication Bill of Rights reboot. Um, and uh, I don't know Amy really well, but I'm getting to know her better. And uh, and I know that you're in for an interesting evening. And then we're going to hope oh, I'm going to chat a little bit about some of the ways that we're using it around the province. And I know some of you have been part of that process. And then I'm also hoping that maybe some of you will share the ways that you might have used the Communication Bill of Rights in your work um, coming forward. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Amy. And um, uh, welcome to virtual Alberta. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry I can't share our Philadelphia springtime with you, but uh, thank you for the welcome. Let me just start by telling you a little bit about myself. Uh, first and foremost, and this is the hat that I'm wearing today, is that I'm a member of the National Joint Committee on the Communication Needs of Persons with Severe Disabilities. Uh, going forward, I will just use the acronym NJC. For uh, 24 years, I ran assistive technology programs for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania uh, out of the University Center of Excellence in Developmental Disabilities at Temple University. I currently am the technical assistance specialist for the basically the eastern U.S. for the national brief history about the NJC. Uh, this was a result of a meeting of the <laughs> Council of Language, Speech, and Hearing Consultants in U.S state education agencies that met together to try to develop national guidelines to meet the needs of uh, children and youth with severe disabilities. As an outgrowth of that, the Office of Special Education Programs in the U.S. Department of Education held a consensus conference that then came out with 33 recommendations regarding the education of children with severe disabilities. Many of those had to do, do with communication. And TASH, I don't know how many of you know about TASH. Uh, T-A-S-H used to stand for the Association uh, for Individuals with Severe Handicaps, quote unquote, and now it's just called TASH. And ASHA organized the NJC. So uh, the first guidance documents were issued in 1992. So 1986, 2016, we celebrated our 30th birthday. So it's an interesting organization in that it has members from prominent organizations that care deeply about persons with severe disabilities. And what do we mean by persons with severe disabilities? It's typically disabilities that are accompanied with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So ASHA hosts the website at www.asha.org slash njc but ASHA does not own the NJC. So our member organizations are including TASH, the American Association for Individuals with Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. Uh, we have TASH twice, sorry about that. CEC, the Council for Exceptional Children, their communication division. RESNA, the Rehabilitation Engineering Society, Rehabilitation Engineering and Assistive Technology Society of North America, 
ATAP, which is the Association of Assistive Technology Act Programs, USAC, which is the U.S. Society for AAC, the U.S. Chapter of ISAC, the International Society for AAC, and I hope that many of you are members of the Canadian Chapter of ISAC, AOTA, which is the American OT Association, and APTA, the American Physical Therapy Association. So it is an interdisciplinary membership by design. The purpose of the NJC is one that includes advocacy, and again, we're talking about individuals who have significant communication support needs. Sometimes we call these individuals with complex communication needs that are accompanied by intellectual disabilities. And of course, there may be a whole host of other disabilities as well. But I think one of the defining characteristics is a focus on people with intellectual and developmental disabilities often a population that is devalued and uh, just not addressed. Again, the focus of the NJC is research, policy, practice, and training. It's a huge need. I don't have the statistics for Canada, but the stats in the US are that there are approximately 2 million Americans who are unable to speak or who have severe communication challenges. We know that there is a huge shortage of trained personnel. We know that there is a need for guidance for interdisciplinary teams and other stakeholders, and that intervention and support for this population uh, needed to include foundational beliefs that are evidence-based that would guide practice. So again, a lot of concerns that uh, individuals with severe disabilities that include intellectual and developmental disabilities and include autism uh, are often left behind in intervention. Um, and we know that particularly in the adult world, once they leave the service system of uh, public education, uh, these folks are particularly needy. So there is a whole host of evidence that individuals with intellectual disabilities are at the greatest risk for victimization. Um, if you haven't read uh, the book Ghost Boy, I encourage you to read it and understand the victimization that uh, he went through, particularly when it was presumed not only did he not have a voice, but that he did not have um, a cognitive level that would enable him to communicate the abuse that he endured. These folks that we're talking about here may or may not be intentional communicators. As a result, they may be using a lot of non-standard communication, which requires more from the communication partners. And they may not be considered good candidates for intervention to improve communication. And in fact, unfortunately, to this day, uh, a lot of speech pathologists, more than I care to admit, uh, look at prerequisite uh, cognitive um, requirements before considering individuals with severe disabilities as candidates for an intervention to improve communication. Now, as I mentioned before, the NJC is interdisciplinary because it is important that no one discipline own communication goals, objectives, and intervention. 
so I uh, was delighted just a couple of weeks ago, uh, along with the representative Judy Schoonover uh, from the American Occupational Therapy Association to present at their national conference in Philadelphia. And I believe that PowerPoint uh, has been posted on the NJC website. It's, uh, it's an excellent PowerPoint because it includes a message uh, through many slides and reference to the AOTA's principles about why OTs need to be engaged in supporting communication. So the NJC represents all these other disciplines but finds the common ground of uh, where these different disciplines should be uniting on behalf of people with severe communication challenges. So it is quite unique, both in the interdisciplinary nature of the organization, the lifespan view, and again, the focus on individuals with severe disabilities, including and especially those with IDD. So some recent work, uh, well, at least the past 15 years or so of the NJC. As I mentioned, uh, the first Bill of Rights uh, was one of the first accomplishments of the NJC uh, before the turn of the century. Uh, so in 2002, uh, they came out with a very strong eligibility statement addressing the fact that eligibility for services should be based on need and, that, and not on other kinds of arbitrary criteria or prerequisites. So I know for me when I was doing more direct service, uh, that it was very important. Even I knew this. I often referred to the NJC as, quote, a higher authority. So don't just believe me, Amy Goldman, SLP, but here's more credible, uh, maybe, more credible uh, and evidence-based work from a national committee to support my position regarding eligibility. They've done some uh, mega analysis. So for example, a review of intervention studies that found that uh, positive change can be made in the communication behaviors of individuals with severe disabilities, actually regardless of their age. So again, sort of debunking this uh, prerequisite uh, eligibility based on age, etc. In 2011, there was a conference that addressed the challenges that confront researchers, and there's some great material still online, and the URL is up there in the PowerPoint and. Uh, Kathy, you can feel free to disseminate this PowerPoint to the attendees. And in 2016, we published the revised Communication Bill of Rights. And here it is. I believe that Kathy did distribute this to you already. This is uh, available for downloading at the NJC website. Again, that's asha.org slash njc. Uh, this is the pretty version. The original version appears in an article by Brady et al. that was published in 2016 in the American Journal on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. And that citation is uh, on the bottom of the uh, suitable for framing. Uh, and JC. So now I'm going to do a little deeper dive into some of the changes in the 2016 uh, NJC uh, Bill of Rights. 
So, and we'll call that uh, for short the CBR. So one of the things that there was was a reordering or in my view, a reprioritization of some of the particular elements of the Bill of Rights. So, uh, number one, and this is, I think, why we all use or how we all use communication first and foremost, and that is it is the way that we interact socially, the way that we maintain social closeness, and the way that we build relationships. So part of what this uh, reflects is the ICF biosocial model. Again, it highlights how important communication is, and it also recognizes that one of the key reasons why communication skill building is important is to promote inclusion in the community and across the lifespan. So I believe requesting was number one, and it is now number two. Yay. So you all probably know that this is the most frequent intervention target. However, we would all acknowledge that if the only thing our friends did with us was to request, we would not necessarily want to continue uh, interactions with those folks. So really, again, the Communication Bill of Rights as being a tool to make sure that first and foremost is the importance of social interaction and relationships. Um, Maybe requesting should have been pushed even further down on the list, uh, but certainly it is important to be able to communicate if you value or are striving to support an individual in self-determination. And person-centered planning is a very important tool to help to identify what those desired objects, actions, events, and people are as well. So refusing and rejecting, rejecting has been added to the revised Bill of Rights, and it adds choices. So here's a uh, interesting aspect of intervention. I remember um, a young man many years ago that I uh, worked on providing him access to AAC. And I did some follow-up, oh, about six months after. I was just a consultant, so I came in, got them on their way, and then withdrew and let the local folks take over. But I spoke with his mom, and I said, you know, how's everything doing with Doug? And she sort of gave me a, okay. And I sensed the reservation in her voice and I said, well, tell me why I'm, I'm hearing that concern in your voice. And she said, well, Doug used to be so easy. And now he's like telling me no all the time. <laughs> And I'm like, yay, Doug, go Doug, you know. Um, but, but certainly the ability to refuse or reject is powerful. And it is something that people with complex communication needs may not have had accessible to them, or they may have been expressing it in ways that were less than satisfying. So again, uh, the Bill of Rights recognize that it is important to understand behavior, behavior as having communicative meaning in communicating refusal or rejection. So the right to express personal preferences and feelings. And again, we're highlighting the fact that your assessment and your person-centered planning process 
should include a way to inventory what these personal preferences are. And again, we're focusing on function, not just form. And it may mean that we have to improve the partner responsiveness to feelings. The right to make choices from meaningful alternatives. <laughs> and so the language in this particular right has been changed a little bit from the right to be offered choices to really focus on the person who is making the choice. So the person has the right to make a choice. And here we have to, as interventionists, make sure that there are authentic opportunities for choice making. This one is new, and it's like one of the things that really brought home to us the need for the update. And that is recognizing that communication is way more than requesting, way more than rejecting. Also, it's the right to make comments and share opinions. Uh, this is difficult to establish, particularly for people who've never even had the opportunity for the first two things. Uh, but it clearly extends the purposes and functions of communication. It is one of the ways that we express ourselves and so is a totally appropriate intervention target. Um, again, drawing on my experience as a clinician, I remember being in a classroom with uh, 10 kids, three uh, teachers, you know, one teacher and two teacher assistants. Um, the students had severe disabilities and they were finger painting. You can imagine the scene. <laughs> so one young man uh, was finger painting and then proceeded to paint himself. He was using orange. Uh, paint himself and anything that was not nailed down. So, but what I saw was the teacher take him and bring him physically over to the sink and she was just making sounds like oh don't touch me you know that kind of thing never once never once did she say you're orange or provide you know and we know so much about modeling so if she wasn't commenting how could we expect the people that we work with to comment so um, it would have been an ideal opportunity to teach him how to make a comment. At, at the very least, you know, dirty, even if orange color wasn't uh, an appropriate target. Wet, dirty, etc. The right to ask for and give information. And that includes information about changing changes in the routine and environment. If any of you have ever been, unfortunately, hospitalized, you know that one of the things as a patient is wanting to know what's going to happen and what's going to happen. So teaching the people that we work with to be able to ask for, in an appropriate, hopefully appropriate form, information, uh, as well as for them to give information about their state uh, is very important. And again, this is all about extending beyond requesting and provides an active role for the individual. The right to be informed about people and events in one's life. This is new in our revised Bill of Rights. 
And again, it supports the role of the communication partners in providing appropriate information. Even though we make such assumptions about the capacity of people with severe intellectual and developmental disabilities to understand. So again, here some uh, support for the role of the communication partners and what we need to be doing. So another right is the right to access interventions and supports. So that language, supports, is new. And there's an implication that those supports are evidence-based. Have our communication acts acknowledged and responded to? And again, this is, I think, what all of us hope, that when we communicate, uh, what we are communicating is acknowledged, even when the desired outcome cannot be realized. So even when somebody is gesturing madly to the door, but it is not time for them to leave, or they cannot leave, or the weather indicates they can't go outside, for that communication to be acknowledged and responded to and not ignored. Another right is to have access to functioning AAC and other AT devices and services at all times, not just at communication time or circle time. Now, the next uh, data, uh, in the U.S., there are about 35 states whose division or Department of Developmental Disabilities use a common uh, quality assurance data tool called the National Core Indicators. Very, very interesting. And you know, if you Google National Core Indicators, uh, you'll see all that data annually. You can break it out by state. You can see the kinds of questions that are asked that have a big focus on self-determination and inclusion and uh, also some civil rights like the right to have private telephone conversations. In Pennsylvania, which where I've done uh, most of my work, we have a program called Independent Monitoring for Quality, I am for Q for short, where we've added some questions. And the I am for Q survey in Pennsylvania is conducted with over 6,000 recipients of developmental disability services a year. So it's a pretty robust sample. And what we have found over the years with uh, really, really persistent, like maybe it changes 1%, 70% of those who report not communicating via speech do not have access to a formal communication system. Wow. So this is uh, very dismal. Um, and you know reflects several challenges in the service system, especially services for adults with IDD. Amy, you're you're, you're making my illusion that things are much better in the states um, <laughs> go away. Sadly, so, yeah, all right. Well, I'm I'm sorry to depress you. Uh, it's probably better for school age children. Right. right. But when, the, when you're talking the adult service system, the communication supports, um, the funding for communication supports is not as there. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Uh, one of our other rights is the right to access environmental contexts, interactions, and opportunities, and the additional language that is added in the revised Bill of Rights is 
these contexts, interactions, and opportunities to promote participation, including opportunities with non-disabled peers. The next right to be treated, spoken to with dignity, and addressed with respect and courtesy. Uh, hopefully this is not new to any practitioner and it's not new to the Communication Bill of Rights. So uh, to be spoken to directly and not in the third present when, in the third person, when the individual is present. And culturally competent interactions. So to have clear, meaningful, and culturally and linguistically appropriate communication with communication partners. And this is very interesting. Um, and it can be challenging, at least in uh, much of the adult DD service system in the U.S. because of wage issues, many of the direct support people are themselves from minority cultures. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's a challenge, not to mention the course, the individuals with IDD themselves who are from diverse cultural and linguistic uh, communities. But certainly uh, that's a clear right. So the implementation of the Communication Bill of Rights is uh, the next challenge. It's one thing to put it on paper. But we know to make it a reality, it's very important to include adaptive functioning within the ID definition, to utilize the ICF framework, to increase the knowledge of different cultures and adapt assessment and intervention, to conduct, uh, to use dynamic assessment procedures, to continue to research and identify effective strategies to change the behavior of the non-disabled communication partners. I'll tell you, in my knowledge, in my experience, it is way easier to change the focus and change the behavior of a person with disabilities than to change that of the communication partners. It is important to continue to focus on meaningful contexts and routines and functional outcomes to move beyond requesting, to increase research in the area of comprehension. Mm -hmm. And I think this is clearly an area where more work needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And I venture to say that we underestimate both the existing degree of comprehension among people with severe communication disabilities, and we don't know enough about the role of augmentation to improve comprehension. Mm -hmm. Of course, we also need to continue to enhance the role of literacy and identify effective practices. We need to maximize all tools, both generic and specialized technologies. We need to look at interprofessional uh, practice uh, through interprofessional education on the pre-service level. Uh, of course, to me, that's a big challenge since people in their pre-professional training as SLPs don't get enough focus on, on this. Uh, we have to hold dear uh, and value self-determination and the right of all people to affect their existence through communication. 
So this is another Declaration of Rights mm -hmm. uh, for you to take a look at. This is the Coleman Institute on Individuals with Cognitive Disabilities. And they have a declaration as well, and they encourage both organizational and individual sign-ons that you can sign on on their website. But it's just another resource uh, that this, while of course communication is involved, uh, it also looks at communication vis-a-vis -vis technology and information access. What I don't have, uh, because I've used most of this uh, presentation in the U.S., and the U.S. isn't a signatory, is to encourage you to look at the U.N. Convention on the Rights of Persons with, um, on the rights of persons with Disabilities. And you will find, uh, if you were to endeavor to do a crosswalk, I think that you would find many of the Communication Bill of Rights um, items are in the UN Convention. Oh, and I'm going to say just for no. I lost you, Kathy. I lost your sound. Oh, sorry. I was going to say just for people's um, awareness, Canada is a signatory to the UN Convention. So, and thank you for reminding me that. I think that's something we might need to talk about kind of along the way. Yeah, and le leverage, leverage that. Yeah, you bet. You bet. Yeah. Um, so, as I mentioned before, uh, we have a website that is hosted by ASHA, and it has lots of resources that you will want to explore. So, other NJC initiatives is... Uh, the NJC meets face-to-face -face twice a year, and uh, last year we looked around and we were like, we all have gray hair. So uh, we have founded the NJC network to encourage um, the next generation of advocates and researchers or early career uh, folks uh, to promote the Communication Bill of Rights to help direct where the NJC does its work. Uh, and some of that comes from the NJC knowing what the field challenges are and for network members to contribute to the body of knowledge. So coming soon are going to be some e-modules. So those of you who are familiar with the work of Karen Erickson may know that uh, with a grant that she had, she has done some excellent modules that are child-based, student-based, to train educators on being uh, aware and sensitive to an understanding of the communication of students with severe disabilities. So the NJC is adapting those modules to address similar issues regarding adults. So we'll be looking at uh, focusing on people of all ages with significant disabilities and their communication partners. One of our uh, recent initiatives where we are continuing to do more work is with addressing myths and misconceptions about communication and adults in particular with severe disabilities. So stay tuned uh, for that. Again, there's recent research that supports uh, the efficacy of interventions and communication supports, even with adults with severe disabilities. As I mentioned, we do presentations at all kinds of national uh, conferences, uh, advocacy, and follow us on Facebook. And here's the article 
um, you might find the article useful, and it's where the uh, National Joint Committee lives. So that is the uh, end of my slideshow, and I'm sorry I took up so much time. No, that's great. That was perfect. That was just perfect, Amy. Thank you. Um, I'm going to maybe ask Ross to give me um, presenter status, and also I'm just going to take a little minute and pause to see if anyone um, has any questions on uh, on uh, on what Amy's talked about or um, what yeah what we've what we've heard so far. You've got presenter status. Yeah, I see that. Thank you. I'm just remember how to yeah. I'm trying to do the do a pause. I'm trying to do a, a lengthy pause where I don't fill the pause with my own stuff. So anybody have any thoughts, questions, comments? A couple things that came up for me and while well, I've give people they can you can put in the chat. Maybe Ross you can watch the chat. Um, is the the importance I mean Amy our group primarily is focusing on um on uh, uh, students or in the but you know it's important I think for us to think really that our students will become adults and we need to be cognizant of the challenges that are still all too real <laughs> for adults with uh, complex communication needs especially adults who have uh, intellectual challenges as well. So that, that's a real takeaway for me. And I'm yeah, glad can to... I, let me sure. just say a few words. You bet. So um, this is definitely um, a real challenge, at least in the US. Uh, we call it transition. Mm -hmm. And that unfortunately, transition planning uh, all too frequently does not include uh, how are we going to transition the use of a device if there's a device in play? How are we going to make sure that the adults, their communication partners in the next settings are prepared to use and maintain the device, including upgrading vocabulary? So if your folks are working with secondary students, so please Keep that future environment uh, really first and foremost in their mind. Uh, actually, if you want, Kathy, I have a little checklist I made up on things to uh, think about. For example, does your student or parent, because the parent is likely to be a constant, have operational competence? Okay, do they know do they know how they got the device? If the device breaks, do they know what to do with it? Um, so uh, remind me, and I will send that to you, and you are welcome to distribute it. Amy, can I just a couple of questions have popped up. One says, does your state offer universal access to speech generating and communication devices for children or is it a candidacy model? So it is for for school age kids, it is up to the individualized education program team. But certainly there, and, and if the team determines that the students should have an AAC device and that need is put in the individualized education program, it is the responsibility of the school district to provide that device. So here's the rub. If the school district spends their money on the device, they can choose to keep it when the individual graduates. Um, but one of the reasons why, if you followed the healthcare debate in the US at all, uh, many kids with severe disabilities receive Medicaid, and Medicaid may be a funder uh, of devices. 
And if it was Medicaid that funded the child's device, then in fact, uh, it would graduate with the child. So I, I hope that helped. Uh, now the reality is that not all school teams jump on board. We have a lot of students who are, um, let me say this politely, stuck with uh, low-tech systems because there is a view that because they are low-functioning, that's all they can benefit from. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and I mean, the question, I didn't give you very much context about Alberta, but we do have to our health system uh, provisions for AAC from cradle to grave, but um, it is a matter of, you know, um, doing matching and many of the same things there, but we at least do not have this fall off point, um, you know, that the device um, it follows the the person and the healthcare system. You know, not that it's perfect by any stretch. We've got lots of things to work through, but it certainly is. Um, it's not. Uh, it, it, some schools do fund devices, especially iPads now, but we do have a provision to to do something provincially. So, which, um, yeah, which is which is great, and it hasn't been around for that long. Um, the other thing that I'm going to just pick up a couple things that you said, and then I'm going to talk really briefly about some of the ways that we've used it. Um, <laughs> I, you talked about a device not only when, when they're doing communication time, but um, circle time. And I, uh, I might add, uh, I'm looking at Karen and Karen Erickson's uh, Literacy Bill of Rights. I w I'm almost thinking they need an Education Bill of Rights that um, communication that they need a uh, right to education beyond circle time. <laughs> Not circle time, no. I'm just particularly um, challenged by that these days. So anyway, um, it was lovely to have you go through them and, and to share the changes. I think that's really important and to help us focus a little bit. Um, I, I'm just going to run through briefly now how uh, at least those of us who are, are part of the COP have used them. Um, last fall, we had some face-to-face -face meetings with people in two locations and um, shared actually the article, Amy. So there's a few people, and I do love that article. Um, there's a few people who have had that, and we had some dialogue around that. I also unpacked a little bit of what I thought were some of the key messages that people would be drawn, could, be, could be drawn from that article. So this whole overview of communications for individuals with severe disabilities, some good guidance in terms of thinking about assessment, and you did touch on that today a little bit, and then some also some important guidance in terms of intervention. And for me, the other really important piece that you've highlighted is that this is a team this is team work and we really truly need to bring the team together and it's um, from uh, bringing that you know you focus particularly on OTs and I, absolutely for me my my real important passion is to make sure that we have teachers who really fully understand and because at the end of the day they're there all the time right parents and teachers parents primarily but you know in, in terms of the classroom environment so i was really happy that you talked about team and that we and we talked about that a little bit we did a little bit of a compare and contrast although it was you did a way better job of comparing and contrast of course um and then what we what we did do as a discussion point was um talk about three things that people so say what are you currently doing to um to make those bring these um rights to life in in with the kids in the classrooms that you're working at how you, might you further operationalize these um, some general thoughts and challenges and i have all of these lovely responses which i haven't collated yet and it's been months but it was a really good dialogue i think and maybe some people who were there might want to share your thoughts again there's room for other people's voices here than mine um, and about how that work went and felt for you but it was certainly very rich dialogue and i 
looking, you know, paying attention to what's really happening in your environment right now was uh, really uh, a useful thing for people. Then I'm also going to share when I do workshops now, and there's lots of them that I, I tend to do, and I know people around uh, on the online are doing workshops all the time as well. Um, I ask people to just take a little look at which of the rights really jumps off the page at you. And an interesting thing for me, it, it and I'm happy that it does jump off the page, is uh, number 14, the right to be addressed um, directly and not spoken for or talked about in the third person up all the time. And wow. I'm and I'm really, you know, it's it, it's this two, it's this double edged, you know. Oh, really? Do we really have to talk about that so much? And then the other hand, because the the lived experience that I have in classrooms is often these kids are spoken about like they are um, they are not, you know, that they're yeah. they're not there. They're not they're not. And you know, it really gives for a great dialogue around um, the fact that we we need to expect that children are understanding everything we say and we cannot, um, uh, that's just incredibly bad practice. But it seems to be, um, and you know what, and I, I say I have been guilty. It's not, it's not, I have been guilty of doing that too. But now, you know, I really um, not only try, and, well, I make a point of catching myself as I'm going there and also just to try and help people redirect that um, the child is present. And, you know, um, the other place that it's come up in my experience is when kids are in hospitals and don't have any communication systems and the way that doctors and nurses talk in front of them. And one young woman who I know who has rats um, talks about the fact that, you know, they're talking about some significant things in her prognosis and she's right there. And, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, yeah, that one just really, it, it's a really profoundly important, right. And, and it both, I guess it both shocks and heartens me that people say, wow, we need to attend to that. We need to do better around that. So, um, yeah, so those are, and, and always having a dialogue around, so what jumps out at you and, and having a launching off point has really been um, provided, in my experience, some wonderful, rich conversations. So I'm hoping to actually maybe write up that, those things that people oh, talk yeah. about and share them out, and I think it would be really, it, it was great. Um, it's just that big thing called time that gets in the way. Um, but as I said, always they're um, they're great. Now the other person, somebody else said to me, I asked them what the difference between the two were, and said that one said, "Oh, these ones are way better because they have pictures." So, is <laughs> so um, is there any uh, anybody doing the work on uh, simulating the the communication, yeah. the new one? Do you is, know? Is that is that the is the, the picture first one? That, from, one oh. of the pictures is the 1992 one, and um, right, right. Yeah. So. First, we're trying, because because the Communication Bill of Rights were published in an article, Yeah, we have permissions that we need to get. Uh -huh. The first thing that we're trying to get is permission to translate them into Spanish and French. Bravo. I've already been asked about that, actually, so that's fantastic, because we need them en français. Fabulous. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But I, I think it... It might have been Scope that did yeah. the pictures. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So maybe we should ask them. There you go. Very <laughs> nice. I still, I can take that on and, and do that for sure. Um, I'm going to sort of close with a couple of um, housekeeping things, but I'm just, again, going to pause anything on the chat. Anyone else? Oh, some people are saying yay for translations. Um, <laughs> anyone else have any thoughts or questions for Amy before we uh, say thank you and let her go? The chat window has been quiet. Okay. All right. That being said, I'm going to do one little advertisement. Amy talked about Isaac in USAC, and um, I'm going to encourage people. Um, they are doing um, uh, last Thursday, this happened, and there will be another one in May. Sorry, I didn't have the right thing <clears throat> in May. But um, USAC is doing this lovely thing called AAC Chat. Um, 
on what would that be the second Thursday of every Thank month you. and um, I've been involved I've been as much as I'm a Twitter person which I'm really not I've been trying to participate a little bit and um, things that happen on USAC are also open to uh, Isaac Canada uh, members so um, I would encourage you this is one more reason to join Isaac Canada and also to think about joining the, the uh, chat I will try and remember to send out the date in our um, communications and um, I know that Amy has done lots of important work with USAC, so um, we're going to be supporting them in, uh, as much as we can. Yeah, we, we then, have a we have a bunch of archived webinars. Oh, as okay. well. Okay, very good. So All right. Remind, so we'll, remind me, and I'll send you the direct link. Love it. We'll definitely do that. Absolutely. Thank you. So. Very good. And then also just, and I don't have the pretty picture, I'm sorry, um, uh, I am actually at a conference in the States, for those of you who don't know, so I'm kind of, um, uh, Kelly Fawner, next, Kelly is going to be doing part three in the environmental communication training webinar, so um, for those of you who haven't caught up with parts one and they're on the ERLC website and for those of you who maybe want a refresher before Kelly does this in May you can do that and otherwise she's going to be closing the loop on this work with us which is absolutely fantastic and um, Amy thank you so very much for spending this hour uh -huh. with us it was most enjoyable and most informative and um, I know you're a busy lady so um, yeah. but we will take your work forward and try and spread it around and make sure that those Communication Bill of Rights get um, operationalized and thought about across Alberta. And I know there's lots of wonderful people online tonight who will take that work further, forward as well. So thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Anything? No more? Oh, hang on. Been, yep. All right. Oh, there's something about working on the sound of the. Art. That's just me, Kathy, because many of the <laughs> videos that were on the URL all right. site. All right. Well, thank you. Okay. Good night, all. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Dan.